Mary Roach, what's Building 9? Building 9 is this enormous structure, Johnson Space Center, where I have all the mock-ups, which are pieces of space shuttles, the International Space Station, like here's a hatch, and here's a doorway, and here's a slide. Anything that you would have to learn how to use in space, the astronauts are all training on it. So it looks, it's, just, it's about the size of the Javits Center here. Huge, huge, huge building. Looks like somebody just exploded a spacecraft because there's bits and pieces everywhere exactly you know, identical to what the astronauts will be working on. So as an outsider, you, you can sort of wander through them like, whoa, this is what the space shuttle, this is like, ooh, this is that lab, and I've seen them on NASA TV. So it's very cool, and it's very popular with tourists because they there's a conveyor belt where all the tourists go, and they're looking for astronauts. And of course, the astronauts are not wearing spacesuits; they're just wearing like a chinos and a shirt, and they don't know that they're actually looking at astronauts. So it's a, it's a, probably the showcase Johnson Space Center building. How did you get in there, nine. and what did you do in there for, for your book Packing well, for Mars? Well, uh, Packing for Mars is well. It's about the astronaut life and how strange and difficult it is to stay alive without gravity and air and all of that. But also, I, it's this world of you know space simulations because anything that they do up there, it's so strange and expensive and dangerous that they rehearse it all in these very bizarre um, simulations here on Earth. So Building Nine was a natural. Uh, I just happened to be in there one day when uh, there was an astronaut working on a, you know, how they're going to configure the interior of a new space capsule. So it was just me hanging out, doing the Mary Roach thing. How'd you get interested in this topic? I did a story for Discover Magazine about 15 years ago where I was covering the neutral buoyancy tank, huge swimming pool where they lower a, a, a scale-sized piece of the International Space Station and astronauts learn how to work in weightlessness. They're floating in water, which is kind of close to floating, not exact, to floating in space. So the, the astronauts will put on their whole, you know, big white marshmallow suit and float around in the water and practice the things they're going to have to do in space. And so I was covering this whole scene. It's just this elaborate, I'm a geek, essentially. I'm sort of, I've always been a bit of a space geek. Uh, and um, I, I, I just, it was fascinating. I talked to my first astronaut, which is harder than scheduling an interview with a celebrity. It really is like, I think it's going to be Friday at 2 o'clock, so be on call. Oh, no, no, it's, it was like a little mission, like a space mission. They've got to, you know, it'll be aborted and rescheduled. And then you get in there like, oh, I'm with an astronaut. And then you, you realize, wow, they're just human beings. It's kind of a, an amazing revelation. Was NASA a hard nut to crack? Uh, they, the NASA Public Affairs Office, um, they are, uh, they, they have certain things they like to talk about and they like to focus on. They have kind of a mission themselves. And I think Mary Roach writing about them, they didn't write, they didn't quite, I think it made them a little uncomfortable. I don't think they really knew, like, what is she going to do? Will she hurt us or will she help us? And I would, like, you know, I wanted, there's, they did a, um, a project that made use of cadavers, and because of stiff, you know, I was like, oh, oh, oh I'll do it. Uh, I want to be there, and they, that just made them. They're like, well, I, we really, I don't, I think, no. Uh, so I had to keep, you know, kind of finding a way around the different channels. I hope that they love the book, but I don't know. Um, they, it was a, a it, it's the government, you know. It, it's it's not as easy as calling up a guy at a university and saying, hey, I want to talk about your work. Great, come on down. It's not like that. So. What's the Vomit Comet? The Vomit Comet. The Vomit Comet is a, a big old plane that's been gutted. So it's just wide open inside and it's used, it's a, it's a weightless simulator. So what they, they take it up and they fly it in these arcs and as it's going over and coming down, you have 22 seconds of weightlessness, so you end up, NASA tests everything from, you know, major components of the space shuttle or whatever the spacecraft is, to the toilets, to meals, like how, how will this packaging behave in zero-g? And as a journalist, uh, you can sometimes, you can get onto these flights if you cover, like, um, there's a certain program. So uh, I managed to get onto one of these flights, and uh, so I, I actually was weightless 
which is an experience I recommend to everybody. If you, you can. in fact write that it was the greatest moment of your life? It, well, it was so because think of it, you're, you have no weight. You are, it's just like you would be, you'd be just floating in the air like a soap bubble. And you feel like you don't feel the weight of your organs, your hair is kind of floating. You're like, ah, it's like back in the womb or something. It's just, uh, it, it was just a wonderful, I loved it. Yeah. Well, being Mary Roach, yeah. you took it a step further and you wrote about weightlessness and sex. I and did, you discovered yes. Sylvia Saint. Who is Sylvia Saint? <laughs> Well, I, I was determined to get past, you know, people write about sex in space and it's usually, well, well, we can't confirm or deny, nobody knows if any, you would think maybe somebody had had sex in space and who knows, and I thought, I'm going to break through this, and I heard about a pornographic film called The, the Uranus Experiments, and the material that I read said that Sylvia Saint, who's a very well-known porn star, had had sex and that they had shot this film in zero G on a, on a um, weightless flight simulator. And I thought I'm gonna track down Sylvia Sane and I'm gonna interview the first person who admits to having had sex in zero gravity. Uh, well, what happened is that I, the people who made the film were actually lovely and they sent me copies of all three of the Uranus experiments and I watched the, Okay, nobody's having sex in zero G, which I mean, it was ridiculous to think that a porn, a porn company would have the money to spend to actually lease one of those planes would be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so um, really, they kind of just sort of shot the shot and turned it upside down so it looks like the commander is weightless and he's not. So that Sylvia Saint, uh, she's retired, by the way. She's gone back to, I think it's Czechoslovakia. And I never did speak to Sylvia, but Sylvia did not have sex in zero G. Sad to say, I was very much looking forward to interviewing her about what, because it's, um, people think, ooh, that'd be really sexy and fun. But in fact, if you talk to marine biologists, who, you know, seals, otters, creatures that actually have to mate without the benefit of gravity, it's tough because you're bouncing apart from each other and you don't, you want to have something to push against. You, so, you also looked into the issue of waste in space. Because that is, everybody's curious about that. And that is, in zero gravity, a real challenge because you depend upon gravity for the separation. Okay? No gravity, no separation, just hovers. And with the Apollo guys, okay, that was a serious morale issue because they had very cramped space and you have a bag and a little finger caught and you had to create the separation yourself. Very distasteful. That was the thing they complained about most during Apollo. So there's this great line, I, I think it might be in the book, where the, uh, the, the, the NASA brass at a certain point said, we have to do better. <laughs> and so they began creating these space toilets which use air drag to, uh, to just sort of pull the, mat the material or waste, as you like to say, away from the body. Uh, but of course, that means you know they got to test these toilets on that weightless flight simula simulator that we talked about. And imagine the volunteer; he's got 22 seconds to produce. So, big challenge. It's a big challenge. Planting a flag on the moon takes yes. a memo. Planting the flag on a moon was uh, that was a, an undertaking, months and months of planning because. For starters, no atmosphere in the moon, no wind. So you want the flag to be sort of rippling in a patriotic manner. And of course, it's this sort of inglorious droop. And so they're like, well, what do we do about that? They, could, so they called in the engineers. They created a, t a crossbar. So it's, it was actually more like a patriotic curtain, just kind of hanging. And it had a bit of a ripple to it. It's very convincing, very, you know, and that's what some of the moon hoax people go on about, like, whoa. How come that flag is flying if there's no wind? But anyway, but even carrying it, to even the moon. carrying it, because you know the, the, there's very little space. I mean, very little room, I should say, on a spacecraft. And you know, you got flag pulled the whole thing. And where are you going to put that? They had a, they put it actually packed it on the outside of the lander, and then they realized, oh, the, you know, the engines that fire to, to slow the descent when they're landing. 
is going to melt the flag. So then they had to create an insulated sheath with like seven layers that that had to. And then on top of that, they're like, well, will the astronauts with their pressurized gloves, which are very hard to operate, will they be able to pull it out or will they be grasping futilely in front of the eyes of the entire world? Like, I can't get it out. Yeah. So all of this, they had a practice.